doing, and especially the report that's being published today, um, I suspect the chances are that if any of you have been anywhere near a radio or a TV station today, um, you will have seen our two authors and heard them uh, talking about this report. There is no doubt that it has um, caused a lot of media interest, and, and I'd hazard a guess probably if we, if we had some metrics, probably the most media interest we've had for one of our reports for a very, very long time. So, um, you know, I'd congratulate uh, the report authors for that. Um, but also, hopefully, it, it adds to the debate um, that's currently so live in Australia around this important issue. Um, perhaps if I just rewind a little bit, many of you might have come across Aspie's work since 2001 when we were established by the then Howard government to provide contestable advice uh, to the Defence Department of the day. And, and really, you know, we've, we've continued along that theme of looking at defence strategic issues uh, more broadly. And so you'll probably be quite au fait with some of that work. Um, and this still continues, and, and much of our work is still looking at that defence sector. Um, but there is no doubting that the winds of change have, change have blown here at Aspie as much as they have in the world. And I think, you know, this is working at a, at, at a rate that sometimes is hard to keep up with. Um, you know, whilst we are healthier, live longer lives than at any point in human history, and, and, and I like to have a positive note because often in security discourse you tend to get a little bit depressed and down because the issues are so serious and um, significant that we deal with, but that is true. We are healthier and live longer lives than at any point before in history. Um, the security landscape changes incredibly rapidly and it evolves in a way which presents policymakers with challenges which are incredibly uh, difficult and also for citizens who are trying to grapple with, with security challenges that they also face in their everyday lives. Um, if you add into this blend technological change and the media-driven environment that we live in, again, that additional pressure that policymakers, politicians feel to have to make decisions um, is intense in a way that I'd suggest didn't exist even 10 years ago. So the areas of counterterrorism. Um, policing, border security, or cyber are all representative, if you like, of this pressure intensive environment um, that policymakers are having to operate on. And, you know, in response to this, ASPE over the past number of years has been developing its work in all of these particular areas. Um, and it's through now its national security programs, which I'm very proud to um, direct and be part of with colleagues. Um, that we are trying to extend this provision of quality, contestable advice on uh, pressured security issues of the day. For me, think tanks really should challenge common assumptions. Um, they should push traditional models of doing business um, in a way that many others would find hard within their everyday working lives and, and provide fresh quality thinking. And I underline that quality um, has to be there for the advice to be uh, usable and, and contestable at the top level and also challenging. I often describe a think tank as, as akin to um, your, your uh, critical friend who, who may not always tell you the things that you want to hear but you know actually it's advice that you probably should listen to, ignore what you don't want to but you know it's certainly advice that's theirs on the table and should be taken seriously. Now I think what we have with this report today um, is really uh, a prime example of this working at all levels. It examines the society-wide problem um, of crystal meth abuse and, and examines the ways to respond to that. Um, and our authors will talk about that uh, further a little bit later on in the evening. And personally, I welcome this report. Aspie welcomes this report. Um, and those of you gathered here tonight, I welcome you again. Um, and I look forward to a fruitful discussion over the course of the evening. Now, firstly, unfortunately, I just have to begin with apologies from uh, the Minister for Justice, uh, Minister Keenan, who has had to withdraw due to um, uh, parliamentary business, uh, which was previously unforeseen. However, um, we're going to begin with our, our guest speakers, who I would like to welcome Gabe Brautman, Mr. Stephen Jones, and Commissioner Andrew Colvin, who've generously given up their time this evening to talk to us on this prominent issue. So if I could firstly ask Gabe Brautman, please, to take the stage. Thank you. Very subdued. Thanks very much, Toby. Uh, look, it is a great pleasure to be here tonight uh, for the launch of this, uh, this incredibly uh, powerful paper. Uh, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting on the Ngunna land of the Ngunnawal people and to pay my respects to the elders past and present. I think, uh, as, as Toby has said, it's, it's timely to be here uh, discussing an issue that is having a devastating impact on the lives of hundreds of thousands of Australians. 
and that's the scourge of, um, scourge of uh, crystal meth or ice on our community. Now I'm pleased to be here representing the federal opposition, uh, in particular the Shadow Assistant Minister for Defence and the Shadow uh, Minister for Justice, David Feeney, who sent his apologies, unfortunately had to, get, um, had to be involved in some committee work. Uh, look, the effects of ice can be found in our cities and in the bush. It can be felt by families, by doctors and nurses, by police and emergency services personnel and by our courts. And there are two elements of ice that strike me as particularly concerning. And I do underscore that, that particularly concerning. It's the highly addictive nature and the ease with which people seem to be able to obtain ice. Now this strategy focuses on ways to reduce the harm to the Australian community, <coughs> ways that don't necessarily rely on seizing drugs or making arrests. It focuses on means to reduce the availability, uh, availability of these drugs, the disruption of user behaviour and the integration of education and health initiatives. And I applaud ASPE and the report's writers, John Coyne, Vern White and Cesar Alvarez, for taking a multifaceted approach. As I said, it covers all those areas. It's the disruption, education, health and, uh, and ways of reducing the availability of the drug. Uh, it's very characteristic of ASPE's general approach to security issues. It's holistic approach to uh, security issues, as Toby said, in this uh, pressure intensive environment that's ever changing. Now, it's clear we have a serious, serious problem on our hands. Australians use more ice than the citizens of any other country. And currently there are 400,000 Australians using ice on a regular basis. It's a serious, serious problem. And the problem's getting worse. Over the past 10 years, the number of injecting drug users who use ice has increased by 52%. And this is despite the fact that there's been record seizures and despite the fact that there's been arrests when it comes to ICE. So what's the answer? This is by, by no means my area of expertise and I'm looking forward to introducing my colleague uh, Stephen Jones to, to uh, discuss um, some possible answers um, in his, uh, his address. But the answer proposed uh, by this report seems to require a multifaceted approach that focuses so in keeping with ASPE's um, general approach to issues and that focuses on supply reduction, arrests and law enforcement, uh, treatment and rehabilitation, education and family, vitally important family being involved in the process as well as community support. Again, I just wanted to, just before I close, I just want to thank ASPE and congratulate the authors of this report. Uh, this first, the, 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 the challenge, the evil that is ICE, uh, really came to our attention uh, as parliamentarians. I mean, we're all aware of what's actually happening in our communities, our individual communities. But more recently, uh, I hosted a, 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 a presentation by ASPE on a broad range of issues, but they were very keen for Vern and his team to discuss this issue of ICE and how what, what the Canadian experience and, uh, and possible ways of addressing it. And you would have heard Vern, as Toby said, he's been a, a media star all day. Uh, you would have heard uh, Vern this morning on AM with Fran Kelly uh, just uh, talking about the fact that there's been an incredible response um, or they've had great results in Canada, particularly in reducing crime, street crime, by 40%, some staggering figure over a very short amount of time by very coordinated and, and uh, kind of forensic approach to, uh, to uh, targeting those ICE users. So congratulations to all involved in this report. Again, congratulations to ASPE for the great work you do and the challenging work uh, you do in terms of uh, uh, bringing to us a range of issues on the strategic front. And I'd like to now to hand over to um, our Shadow Assistant Minister for Health, Stephen Jones, who's been very, very active in this space and uh, a very active speaker in Parliament about the problems caused by us. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Gay. Uh, great to be with you on your patch, I think. We're in your electorate today uh, as well. Uh, and uh, you have been a good advocate for these issues and the work of ASPE uh, in Parliament, particularly amongst the Labor caucus. So I pay tribute to that. Uh, Tobias, uh, to you and the organisation, thanks for the opportunity to talk. Uh, I welcome uh, this report and the contribution that the authors have made. Uh, Vern White and uh, John Coyne, I listened to your... Uh, prelude, your entree, if you like, on Radio National this morning and some other media outlets, uh, and I think you took the issues up very well. 
Uh, I also welcome the fact that we're going to have uh, uh, Andrew Colvin speaking on the same matter. I'm probably going to approach this from a slightly different perspective um, and I want to take the opportunity, if not the challenge, to throw some alternative thinking around this. I'm going to approach it from the health perspective. Uh, what I really liked about the report, uh, you didn't use this language, perhaps I think it's the language used by, I think Bill Heffernan uses it from time to time, and certainly some of our American uh, colleagues, I think it's time for us to call bullshit on policies that don't work. Uh, and I think we have to do uh, what we can as policy makers to be a bit more courageous, and particularly as politicians and policy leaders, to be a bit more courageous to lead the, poli the, the population and lead the policy makers in the right direction. And I love uh, what this report has done in, in particular areas. The fact that uh, you're calling out uh, the obsession on uh, a political focus around seizure rates uh, when all the evidence shows that that is not having uh, a significant impact uh, on uh, with either addiction levels or supply levels or price levels. Uh, I think this is a tremendously important contribution to the debate. Um, look, uh, my colleague has prepared a seven-page page speech here, and I, I'm going to do honour to his uh, work by uh, refer, referring to some of it, otherwise he'll get grumpy with me when I, I get back. But look, we know, as Gay has said, that uh, ICE is having a terrible impact uh, on our community. Um, I want to put that in perspective, though, uh, because I look at this from a health perspective. Um, I don't look at it through the lens of a tabloid newspaper. It is a problem, but I look at all of our alcohol and other drug problems within the community. It's a problem, but it's nowhere as near as big as a problem that we've got with booze. And I want to make that quite clear. And any of our friends from the uh, law enforcement community, I'm sure, any of the people who are dealing uh, with domestic violence incidents on a Friday night to a Sunday night where it can be between 60 and 80% of the workload would say, yep, We've got a problem with ice, we've got a problem with methamphetamine, but let's not drop the ball on some of these other issues as well. I think it's important that um, we rely on the evidence and the data, and I love what the report does about that. We've also got to focus, we've got to acknowledge that um, we've got to avoid uh, language and strategies which stigmatise people who are in often, oftentimes the victim. I spent a lot of time going through drug and alcohol treatment centres and it is remarkable from centre to centre. Uh, I ask people um, uh, a simple question about uh, the causes and the backgrounds to people who come into these treatment centres, uh, and uh, without a doubt, and you know, methamphetamine has increased on the, as a drug that uh, they're treating with, without a doubt, between 85 and 90% of the people who are seeking treatment in a rehabilitation centre have a pre-existing trauma. Uh, a sexual abuse, a physical abuse, a psychological abuse that existed and uh, in, many, in many instances their drug addiction or their drug problems is an instance of self-medication. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing everything we can uh, to interrupt and to deal with the supply side of the problem, but in doing that we should not be victimising or stigmatising the people who are already dealing with a, a huge degree of trauma in their life. So the report talks about the increases in detec uh, detections, arrests, seizures, increase in sentences. Uh, it seems to be a knee-jerk political response uh, to what you describe in the report as a moral panic. Um, a knee-jerk response is to increase sentences. Uh, and I think uh, we are right uh, to be sceptical at least about that as a response that is going to work. There's been an unprecedented level uh, of police activity um, and uh, I take my hat off to the men and women of our law enforcement community who are involved in this. There's been, um, over, there's been an increase uh, in seizure rates by over 60 uh, times uh, in the last four years alone. I think that's picked up in the report. Uh, more than four tonnes of methamphetamine, by the way, has been intercepted in this year alone. Uh, but what's happened to price? Um, it's remained constant, a point uh, uh, made by the Minister for Justice uh, during question time a few weeks ago. He was in dismay. We've uh, intercepted more than four tonnes of the stuff this year, but price has either flatlined or gone down. So we've got to ask ourselves, are the strategies that we are deploying at the moment working? 
if we're to take an evidence-based approach, uh, the answer has got to be no. Um, it's not new to us, by the way. Um, uh, in uh, 2014, a study conducted in New South Wales looked at a similar uh, sort of problem. It was uh, a la one of the largest Australian studies in an analysis of large-scale heroin seizures, heroin, cocaine and amphetamines across the state. The researchers found that increases in seizures did not reduce the number of overdoses or arrests for possession or use of those drugs, nor was there any great impact on the uh, drug-related crime. There's no consistent effects of supply control measures such as the seizure frequency, the seizure weight, the supply arrests were found for either uh, theft, robbery or assault. Um, like so we've known this for a while. What we're doing at the moment simply is not working. Um, and as a, wi a much wiser man than me once said, the definition of insanity is to keep doing what you are doing and thinking you are going to get a better or a different result. Quite simply, we will not. Our prisons, um, the lock them up, um, throw away the key, uh, key response. Um, again, for politicians, often very attractive. Around 12% of male prisoners, 17% of female prisoners are there for drug offences. Um, if we, there are about 34,000 people, by the way, in prisons in Australia today. They're busting at the seams. If we only arrested 10% of what we suspect to be uh, habitual drug users, uh, methamphetamine users in the country, I cannot calculate the new number of prisons that we, we'd be arresting um, about a, it'd be about a 30% increase in our prison population. So that strategy is not going to be the answer to what we all agree is a significant human health uh, and law and order issue. The average cost in prison, by the way, is about $290 a day. So it's a pretty expensive uh, service delivery mechanism of last resort. Uh, we've got to be finding a different way to do it. So we're going to be looking um, to solutions that actually work. Across the ditch uh, in New Zealand, they've been looking at this problem and put in place an integrated strategy. They've discovered that if we're putting more money into prevention and treatment, the number of people uh, who are actually using methamphetamines has decreased. In fact, they've halved the, in their national surveys discovered after letting the strategy run for a number of years, over half the people, uh, uh, half the number of users by changing the emphasis of where we are spending our money. We currently spend about $1.7 billion per year, by the way, um, on uh, our national drug strategy. A little bit more, but roughly that. Um, around about 22% uh, in uh, uh, treatment programs, uh, much less than 10% on prevention programs. So um, I think our law enforcement community um, are doing a fantastic job. I very much welcome uh, the findings of the report, the emphasis in there, the evidence base and, so, and, and the call for us to be doing something different. Uh, and what I hope to do in the small contribution I've made today is throw a bit more evidence in there. Absolutely salute the call that you make that we need an integrated strategy. And I love the fact that you've called us on the fact that uh, that notion of integrated strategy has been trashed a bit. The currency has been trashed often by politicians like myself who say we need one and say we've got one, but actually we've basically got a whole bunch of silos uh, working perhaps in tandem but not together. So there are a couple of contributions. I look forward to listening to what other people have got today. And uh, David and myself are working on our policy response to this and other areas in the alcohol and other drug field. And we hope to be able to inject some of your learnings uh, from this great report into that policy development. Thank you very much. Okay, Stephen, thank you so much for your, for your opening comments. Um, now I'd like to welcome Commissioner Andrew Colvin from the Australian Federal Police. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Toby. Uh, in some ways, I feel like perhaps the black sheep of the party uh, this afternoon. But uh, let me first of all acknowledge uh, what was already been said, that I uh, want to acknowledge that we're on the land of the traditional owners uh, and recognise the elders past, present and future and say thank you very much to Aspie, uh, Toby, to you for uh, the continued good work that you're doing in this space, but Vern and John, to you particularly for the, for the very good work that you've done on this paper. 
Uh, it is a pleasure and certainly an honour for me to get the opportunity to come and say a few words as launching it. Uh, and let me say at the outset, it's very hard to disagree with anything that's been said already tonight. Uh, I think the richness of this paper is that we need the discussion, we need the debate, and this is a very complex, complex issue. So uh, in saying that, I welcome the launch of ASPE's special report this evening. The report challenges the prevailing ideas that exist regarding Australia's response to the ice problem, and it offers us alternative frameworks that will further inform the policy debate that, as we all know, is currently underway. ICE is a complex issue and it will require a complex solution and a complex response. The solution will not be quick and we have to accept that it will not be easy either. As highlighted in this report, Australia's response requires an integrated and an innovative response if we are to have any success or any hope to be successful. Ongoing cooperation and collaboration both domestically and internationally between law enforcement, our health partners, our education sectors will be critical if we are to be successful. To understand the, ice, the current ice problem though, it's also important to understand the differences between it and other drug types in the market. Importantly, ice is a synthetic drug and therefore production is easier and supply is dramatically increasing. The purity is also high and it continues to increase and the price, as we've heard, remains stable. The current accessibility to ice in the community directly correlates to the reported increase of its usage. And in July this year, COAG noted that 1.1% of the population, small in percentage terms, but large when you think over one in 100 people, regularly use ICE, and the biggest users being people in their 20s, the people who are the future of, the, of, of this country. Uh, concerningly, the use is not just in urban areas, but it's increasingly now affecting our rural communities in a very, very dark way. Now, as we know, the impacts of this use are far reaching and they are pervasive. It affects all communities, and each component of our society. So in responding to this challenge, it's clear that there's an important role for law, law enforcement in tackling the supply of the drug. However, as we've always acknowledged, we cannot rest, arrest our way out of this problem. And I don't believe that there will be a senior law enforcement official in this country that would argue with that notion. Our national law enforcement efforts have been successful and have seen much success over the years, yet the ICE problem continues to be as pervasive and as real as it, ever, as it has ever been. We've seen many statistics and many are quoted in the paper and the statistics reflect that. The number of national seizures and arrests in the 2013-14 year were the highest on record, with seizures continuing to increase year on year, over four tonnes in 13-14 and an even bigger figure in 14-15. Uh, these were seized and 744 clandestine labs were detected in the 13-14 financial year, primarily in residential areas. So it's a complex supply problem as well as a complex demand reduction problem. However, while targeting supply is not the sole solution, stemming the supply of ice will continue to be a key element of any holistic strategy and will require an innovative approach to prevention and disruption in addition to those traditional prosecution outcomes. In, address, in addressing the supply chain, we're also combating organised crime more broadly, as more than 60% of Australia's highest risk criminal targets on the National criminal, tar criminal Target List are known to be involved in the methamphetamine market, and 45% of those high risk criminal targets are characterised as outlaw motorcycle gangs. So the AFP is uniquely placed to contribute both domestically and offshore through its collaborative arrangements with traditional and non-traditional partners as well to target the origin of this organised crime across the full spectrum of the criminality. The AFP's international reach includes 100 liaison officers in around 29 countries or in 29 countries around the world. And this capability continues to play and will continue in any strategy that we devise, will continue to play a vital role in working with our partners to stem the flow from source countries and common transit points. The AFP will also continue to contribute to the work of the Commonwealth National ICE Task Force that we know a lot about. And we, of course, like everybody else, look forward to future consideration of its recommendations. And I'm sure that this report will be taken as part of that task force consideration. So much has been done by law enforcement as well as many other sectors to respond to Australia's ICE problem. However, we all need to acknowledge that more needs to be done and it's important that ASPE, as we've seen tonight, and others continue to challenge the ideas that we have to con continue to challenge those policy settings. Perhaps, as a previous speaker has said, um, if the policy is bullshit, then we need to call it to be bullshit. <laughs> but it needs to be integrated and it needs to be innovative if it is to be successful. 
So in closing, can I again thank the authors, thank Toby and Aspie more generally for their continued efforts in this space, in ICE, but also in the national security debate. Uh, but thank you for preparing this special report. Uh, we welcome the contribution this paper adds to what needs to be a very rich policy debate. So congratulations and thank you very much. Andrew, thank you very much for your contribution this evening as well. Now, um, Aspie is incredibly lucky with the caliber of all of its staff. Um, that's something that's always a privilege to work here and have your ideas challenged by the standard of thinking that we have. Um, interestingly, with our, our two authors tonight, though, they bring a blend which is often very rare to find. One which is, on the one hand, many, many years probably more than they care to remember, of operational experience, um, but also a lot of academic experience too, and the credentials to back that up, which I think further reinforces um, the poignancy of, of the report they're releasing tonight. So um, firstly, we were lucky enough to steal Vern White away from Canada um, to share some of his thinking. So I, I'd like to ask you to come to the podium, Vern, and say a few words. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. I thought I'd be the first person to say bullshit tonight. I'm disappointed <laughs> in both of you. Uh, thanks to everyone who came this evening. A special thanks to Ms. Broadman, Mr. Jones, and of course, uh, the Commissioner. I truly appreciate that you found the time. Of course, to Toby for the introduction. Uh, something's obvious since I arrived in Canberra. That, are, that is that the issues facing Australia are very similar to those issues that face my home country of Canada. Near the top are safety, security issues, including health and crime issues that, if not an ep epidemic, has certainly plagued this nation. That is, of course, the ice addiction gripping the country. The problem of drug addiction is not new to Australia. You battled the heroin addiction of the 90s, as we did. Australia continues to be identified, though, as one of the most serious addiction problem nations, particularly in relation to ecstasy, methamphetamines, and cocaine. But today, I'm going to focus on ice. Crystal methamphetamine, to put it bluntly, is eating apart some of the very communities that you have, uh, physically uh, eating apart the people that are addicted. Now, there are many ways to tackle the addiction problem, and I've worked in policing for over 32 years at the local, provincial, and national level for three different police agencies in three provinces and three territories in Canada. Sounds like I can't keep a job. <laughs> but the reality, having combated uh, drug use um, for all of those years, I've yet to find a solution that works for everything, for everybody all the time. Having law enforcement attacking drug dealers who prey on the most vulnerable society is obvious and appropriate choice but what else can we do? First, let's understand the issue. There's been research that has focused on drug addicts and their involvement with the justice system. It's identified that the average street addict living on the street is committing between four and eight crimes per day to gain the funds to purchase the drugs to get high. Some addicts will tell you they're committing dozens of crimes each day. In fact, some addicts have told me that. Having been involved in research of more than 190 14 to 18 year old female addicts in Ontario, more than 50% identified that they had traded sex for drugs, and a further 80% stated they had committed crimes just prior to being placed in treatment, most often thefts from families, to, for their own family to buy drugs. So you see, for these young teen girls and other addicts, and for our community, moving addicts into treatment can be a crime prevention tool, four to eight crimes per day. So we need to attack those dealing drugs, absolutely. They must be held to account for their actions, preying on the vulnerable, but as well, we must have a collaborative approach to deal with the addiction that is stealing the lives of those addicted. Tackling addiction, as I said, can be assisted by law enforcement, but more than that is required to loosen the grip that ICE has and the dealers have on your communities. Australia's success with heroin was about innovation, integration, and the willingness to find new solutions to an old problem. In fact, I would argue if you dislike change, you'll dislike irrelevance even more. Australia was relevant in the fight against heroin because they looked for alternatives to the norm. So tackling the ice problem, what do I think we need to focus on? I think we do have to focus offshore, and I think John will speak about that, whether it's precursors or ice itself coming into this country. I think we do have to target those involved in selling drugs on the street, making it difficult, impossible for them to continue so we have a chance to work with those who are addicted. I think we do need to develop a long-term strategy with addictions providers, ensuring that the access to residential and non-residential treatment is a priority. Remember, it's more than a health uh, case of uh, health care. It's also a crime prevention tool. In the report, you'll see one example of Ottawa, Canada. In fact, in Ottawa up until 2007, our city had become the crack capital of Canada, as it was reported by the, Ottawa, the uh, Globe and Mail. In fact, we had so many addicts on the streets that people stopped caring. 
crime was going up in certain areas of the city, in particular crime committed by uh, addicts on the street. So we decided we had to do something different and we focused first and foremost on targeting local drug dealers. Now we did it in often the, no the way most police agencies do, by buying drugs from them. And then we started to release them on bail with conditions that they were banned from certain areas of the city where they were selling drugs, which made it difficult from the traffic. Then we reported them to, to our social services uh, workers because they were also committing a fraud against social services by taking money from us, income, without reporting it to social services. Again, making it difficult for them to continue. But we did this because we wanted access to addicts. We wanted to find a way that we could move addicts into treatment, both residential and non-residential, to try to make a difference in their lives. Now, we didn't have access to the treatment programs any more than you do here, to be fair. We had similar numbers. So the police service took on a primary function of raising money to open drug treatment centers in the community. In fact, we raised $3.5 million so that we could open two drug treatment centers in the city of Ottawa. Today, both of those are operating. At the same time, we raised another $3 million with community groups and not-for-profits so that we could put a drug treatment counselor in every single high school because we wanted to get people before they were addicted. We didn't want to drag people off the streets who are addicted already. We wanted to actually influence their lives beforehand. We secured provincial and federal funding from both the Liberal and the Conservative Party to support both of those initiatives. Since then, we've seen hundreds of people go through our treatment programs. We've seen thousands of youth, families, and parents impacted positively by the school-based counseling program that I spoke about. But at the foundation of this was also a need to reduce the street-level crime that we were seeing growing every single day. And in fact, one of our tests would be that if we did not re reduce the level of crime on the streets, then we would not be successful. Over the first three years of this initiative, we decreased street-level crime by a full 40% in our two most challenging areas, while seeing no increase in crime in other areas, often an issue around displacement. The police were seen as a key ingredient to the success of this program. In fact, it would not have happened without the police. The police were the drivers of this initiative. It included government schools, health programs, community not-for-profit, and, and the community itself. ICE has a tremendous grip on this country, in fact. I would argue it might be the worst I've seen anywhere. Primarily because ICE at attaches itself so quickly to people, they become addicted so fast, and the response from them is so dramatic. The Ottawa example I describe is important, but only from the perspective that we can find a solution if we keep our open mind to new ideas and we're willing to use the entire community to develop those ideas. I know that maybe we may not win the war on drugs, I've been told that for 32 years, but if we want to continue to be in this battle against drugs, we're going to have to find a new way. I want to thank you again for being here this evening. Thank you, Vern. I'd like to now welcome uh, the other, one of the other authors uh, of this paper, Dr. John Coyne. Please, John. I took your notes, John. <laughs> There's nothing worse than becoming the last speaker of an evening like this because so much ground has already been covered. Um, I will say from the start, this morning at 6 o'clock, um, and by that stage, we're, Vern and I were two, uh, two interviews into a 19-interview day, um, and we're sitting up at um, Parliament House at checkpoint one, um, talking, and Vern says to me, um, he goes, John, can I say BS on Australian <laughs> national radio? Will it be OK? Um, and I suspect um, Vern, being a very senior ex-police officer, that I'll get a slight nudge in the ribs afterwards, because my response was, no, it wouldn't be OK. <laughs> I did expect to get a text message from him shortly thereafter that he had done it, but it's been a long day, and there's so much ground you can cover and so much ground that people have already covered. So what I'll do instead, and um, I'm an ex-soldier, so many times I sat on patrol, on um, parade grounds and watched very senior people pull out big wads of paper and start talking. So as Vern has stolen my notes, um, I'll speak a few things from the heart. Um, and we'll start in no particular order, but I guess the start is probably pretty good. So when Vern came as a visiting fellow here, I had already written um, a submission to the ICE task force. And we sat down and, um, as old and bold do, and had a long conversation about how we would do things differently. And that became um, the starting point for a really quite powerful journey. Um, and by powerful because, as we discussed, and this is part of why tonight is so important, um, Vern has over 30 years experience in law enforcement. I come from 25 years of experience working in the military and intelligence, the last six with the Australian Federal Police. Um, what we should be standing here today 
as a general rule from a you know, very theoretical perspective is telling you that enforcement works, you know, that we must fight and continue the hard war against drugs. Um, I guess we still are saying that, but in a slightly different way, which is we need to be balanced. Um, after some 19 interviews today, and some, I worked it out earlier today, some 220 odd questions, that brings me to my next point. Um, you know, people keep on asking, um, and there's some common patterns in there. One of which is, well, what's the worst harm that this thing is doing? This ice problem, or this ice epidemic, this ice challenge. Um, you know what, there is no worst harm in this. Okay. Um, I did have a, a couple of things to read you, but I won't read them, because I'll tell you quite honestly, um, three weeks ago, um, a, my young cousin who's in his late 20s is sitting down with two school friends on a Saturday night drinking. One of them gets up, grabs a knife, and stabs and kills his best friend and then seriously stabs and injures him. Um, he's in intensive care for two weeks. Ice harmed me that day and it harmed him indirectly. Um, two weeks ago, on a Saturday morning in our lovely town here of Dixon, it's 8.30 and my two and a half year old son wants to go to the bathroom. Um, so we take him off to the ambulant toilet at Dixon and parenting toilet. I open the door and a young 20 something year old man is injecting something into his veins and slams the door shut back in my face. Now, when I said to you that I'm the sort of conservative, you know, like I should be saying a certain message to you, I'm not hating or vilifying those people. What it proves to me is that we need to do something different in this country. Part of doing something different, and the two final points I'll speak about, is taking the gloves off and allowing um, our great police forces in this country the opportunity to apply innovation. I'm not saying throw away seizing drugs. What I'm saying though, is give them the opportunity to innovate, okay? Because at the moment, you are getting here in Australia, the policing services at state and federal level that your key performance indicators demand. They're doing exactly what you want. They are seizing more drugs every year. They are arresting more offenders and they are seizing more cash all the time. However, their most innovative work is not what appears on the PBS statement. Over the last couple of years, and I'll give you two really great examples. In 2008, um, a senior sergeant sitting in Cambodia is speaking to the Cambodian officials, and he discovers that saffron oil and a large quantity had been seized in the jungles of Cambodia. The Cambodians needed assistance getting rid of that. As a result of the innovative work of a single staff member sitting there working with his headquarters back here in Australia, a five year drought in the supply of ecstasy resulted. A five year drought. Similarly, at the end of 2012, the AFP faced a strategic problem in a supply route. Heroin was being smuggled internally across a range of flights from Ton Sutnut Airport in Ho Chi Minh City arriving in Sydney and Melbourne. Through working with the local authorities, providing them with an investment, an ion scanner, that problem ceased to exist. Innovative solutions come from releasing our police officers here in Australia and our policing agencies from the tyranny of over-restrictive fascination and fixation on key performance indicators. And finally, I'll talk about disruption. Um, Throughout the day, people can be saying, I'm surprised all of our ATS, or a lot thereof, originates out of um, China. Um, it's not a surprise. I mean, the Australian Crime Commission has been raising it some time. Um, the, what was Australian Customs some 10 years ago was identifying that there was a growing problem with um, ATS and its precursors originating out of China. We need to take the front line with disrupting the supply of ATS to Australia and that front line where we can have a strategic impact relies on us doing work at a whole of government level in China. So I did promise that I wouldn't um, carry on too much and do what a number of generals have over the years and which is make you sit here and listen to me carry on. So thank you very much. So we have a bit of time for, for Q&A with the report authors, and, and if I could just ask them to both join me. Now, whilst you're all thinking of, of appropriate questions to throw at them, please make them incredibly difficult, make their lives tough, make them think further than they've actually presented within the report. 
I'll, I'll start with a fairly easy one, but a fairly easy question on the surface, but a difficult one. So you've both spoken about disruption um, and the fact that we need to get away from perhaps the kind of traditional metrics of success. Um, how do you sell that? I mean, I've seen this in the UK context. I'm seeing it here in different arenas. How do you sell that to politicians, um, but also to the broader public, that this is something that can make their lives um, infinitely better and safer in the long run? Um, I, I'd be really keen to see, you know, Vern, perhaps how you sure. did that in Canada, but also, John, some of your thinking on that question, please. Sure, you know, it's um, when I was the police chief in Ottawa, I, I think I did 52, in, 52 town halls in my first 52 weeks. And there wasn't a town hall I went to that the public didn't say they want to feel safer and have less crime. I've yet to hear any of them say they wanted more people arrested, more criminals. They all said, I want less break and enters. I don't want somebody stealing my lawn chair off my front deck. They all said the same things. They wanted to see less crime. My argument would be that the public's perspective is probably, in, in fact, quite measurable around do they feel safe in their own community. And I think that's really what the public are telling us. Um, at the end of the day, we are dealing with addicts who have a drug issue that can, for the most part, can be managed with the right treatment, if we have that treatment. Drug dealers, I, I would argue, we continue to attack them as we always have, but I think from, from my perspective, the disruption model, if the public feel they are safer, and I talked about the two communities we had where we saw 40% reduction, we saw, challenging in one area, a tremendous increase in home values as a result that the community actually, in some cases, weren't happy with because all of a sudden their, their tax rates went up as well. But I think that is a true sign of success when we have places uh, that all of a sudden see it as a better place to live and a more safe and secure place to live. So I don't think it's a public issue. I think it's our issue that we get caught up in the numbers more than they do, actually. Maybe China disruption. Look, I... Are you going to fix that? <laughs> yeah, I've heard that today. Um, <laughs> I think we're doing it tonight. Um, the first part about it is, is that we're, this is about qualitative stories. Okay? This is about storytelling. This is about taking um, some of the great achievements that are already being done and selling those to our communities. You know, it's the fact that, and I burned someone the other day, you know, it's a group of uh, UK police officers who got together to create a 12-month program to get um, recovering addicts jobs. Um, and it's telling those really powerful stories about those sorts of programs that people are already doing and moving people away from, um, you know, it of course makes you feel safer when you watch um, you know, senior police officers standing beside a gigantic table uh, with 100 kilos of drugs and two armed police officers talking. You know, that, that, that gives you a sense of you can see it, touch it. Well, we need to create an alternative sense of seeing and touching it, and that's what we're doing here now. Um, and the role of an, uh, our policy institute and think tanks in Australia, which is contributing to the public policy dialogue. And I think that's what the most important message of that is. So, John... That's absolutely. I mean, John, God help us all, but I'm now going to make you um, the owner of all of the agencies that deal with this in Australia. Um, and, and that's a dangerous situation to be in. But, but with that um, comes the fact that you now have to create that um, innovation that you were talking about. You know, throw the shekels off. That was what you were speaking about. How are you going to do that now you've got power of all agencies? How do you throw that off? How do you enable innovation of process? Um, <laughs> it's not actually that difficult. We already have some of the best, and I spend an extensive amount of time with um, the Australian Border Force, Department of Immigration, Border Protection. I just finished up six years um, with the Australian Federal Police and I've worked extensively with the ACC during that period of time. The individuals there, when we're talking about, indivi when we're talking about innovation, already exist within those organisations. What we're saying is we're taking them away from the imperatives of um, increasing our seizure rates and putting them towards identifying programs. Um, and a prime example, I've been fortunate enough in the AFP on a number of occasions to see reporting that comes in from the Australian Federal Police's international network and the ideas that originate out of the Australian Crime Commission. Those ideas are there. Um, what we need to do now is provide the appropriate resources to germinate those and provide the appropriate focus. And that's what, where it starts now, is removing the political imperative and the rest will come. It's already there. I, I'm going to happily keep asking questions. It's easy no, for me. <laughs> please, please, Stephen Jones, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, you're saying we should focus on... Your, your comments about uh, the, the analysis about going further up the supply chain, focusing on the precursors in China, 
etc. I agree, the data in there is all spot on. Why do you think if we knock that off, it doesn't move somewhere else? Um, I, I, do, I think it will move somewhere else. And in fact, I mean, I will go as far as saying, you know, you only have to pick the major manufacturing centres for pharmaceuticals and chemicals. Um, one point I haven't raised tonight is that you know, we have a preoccupation here in these sorts of subjects to talk about it in the same sense as we do with some sort of adversarial thing. We will beat ice. Um, we will not beat ice. We will reduce the harmful impacts ice has on our community. If we concentrate on beating ice, we won't do it. Um, so yes, you're right. So when, we fin when China finishes, there'll be some um, criminal entrepreneur in India, in Iran, um, in Russia, or in any other number of countries that produce um, the required precursors who will take their, their place. And then we'll then we look for equally innovative solutions to tackle those. Um, it's the same problem we've had to a degree um, with things like ecstasy. It's a battle that continues on, and it's why it won't on its own also address the problem. It's why those other components are so important and the integration is. No, just the other piece, I think, that uh, remembering that our focus as well is on educating young people. I mean, Australia's had a tremendous success over the past 30 years on impaired driving and things like that. If you look at the results, they're quite spectacular. Both Canada and Australia have tremendous success among young people smoking, much lower than it was. And in fact, young people wouldn't allow an adult to get into a car without a seatbelt in either of our countries right now. They're not, young people aren't stupid. They just need to know what the facts are. And I think it is a, a lot about education if we want to disrupt this. I think that's part of the disruption model that we have to consider as well. Do you have a sense of where Australia would be in five or ten years' time if we don't change uh, the way we're, we're operating now? Well, you I'll go from a, yeah. a health perspective uh, first. Uh, I mean, I've been calling around to different states about the capacity when it comes to drug treatment, and uh, one state in particular, uh, 200 beds, 15 youth beds. I then called three high schools who told me they could fill the 15 youth beds in that same state. So I think if we don't look at how we can, a four-month wait list minimum, in some cases six months, as one uh, official told me, it's only four months because we actually take them off the list after four months. Um, if we don't have some solution around uh, developing a long-term strategy for addictions at that end of it, four months for an ice addict is a death sentence. Um, it, um, we, can't, we can pretend that it's just a health care delay. It's really much more than that. So I think from my perspective, that's an area that has to be focused on. If we're going to have a dramatic impact, we're going to have to actually be ready to deal with those people who are addicted right now. From the disruption side, I think you can probably talk better from the Look, side. I think the answer to that question is, is if we don't change what we're doing now, we'll be in exactly the same position we are. Now, you can talk about it in, you know, in scales. Um, it's still just as much of a tragedy today if one person's child dies as it does of um, an ice overdose as it is of five. Um, I'm not sure what the scale... If we don't change what we're doing now, I'm not sure what the scale will look like in five years, but it's not going to get better. So, you know, our young people will still be... Um, lost um, the economic opportunity. So if you want to be a realist and look at economic opportunities, the opportunity cost of that, of the investments that we'll have to make, um, the lost productivity of those people who aren't gainfully employed in um, our society, um, they just keep on going on and they will not get better. John, uh, I know that uh, at the, at the uh, presentation you did up at Parliament House, um, John and Vern, uh, my colleagues were particularly interested in the KPIs. Now, you've, you've t kind of touched on them, but it is a real challenge for public policy makers to uh, sort of reach, define what the happiness index is. You know, how is public policy benefiting people, uh, apart from just a whole range of measurements or KPIs on output? So, you have touched on a safe community, uh, less crime, but could you go into a bit more detail about other qualitative KPIs uh, that you think we should yep. be looking at rather than... Oh, of course, there's a quantity of ones. They'll be there. Yep. But what are the other qualitative measures that we should be looking at? I mean, my, my perspective uh, is a little different. Look, I, I, I focused on the whole of community safety perspective, and we targeted actually reduction in crime, street-level crime by drug addicts as being a success story. Don't get me wrong. We laid thousands of charges against hundreds of traffickers to get there. 
because we wanted to remove them from the streets so that our addicts, who actually then we would notify local doctors that we're going to have addicts showing up pretending to have injuries because they would be looking for oxycodone or other drugs. I mean, I just think you have to look at it more from a holistic perspective. How, house prices going up, actually, we saw as a positive indicator of a safer community. We saw those things as positive indicators. To be blunt and, and not always politically <laughs> smart, none of this probably will get people reelected. At the end of the day, the, the, off, the off ramps to success may be longer than the two, three, or four years that politicians want to see success at, but they're not longer than what a community expects. Um, and we'd had a lot of discussions around this because in, in the sense of costs, you know, like why invest so much money in, in this program, for instance, rehabilitation for teenagers in Victoria? Um, and some of the performance measures we need to th look about are the, the opportunity costs of that. For instance, there's a number of surveys that say, for instance, uh, for every dollar spent on rehabilitation, you save $8. Um, so there's some of the hard and fast performance measures that we need to look at. Um, fear of crime, uh, which is always a favourite amongst criminologists and my peers in academia, um, you know, it has its own weaknesses and flaws, but, you know, it's part of a of a rich tapestry of performance measures and we need to move away from that. Um, I mean, the challenge here is there is no great performance measure to show you that in, the, in a quantitative and qualitative sense that you're absolutely working because there is no absolutes in this game. Um, it's a terribly complex problem that requires, um, requires a degree of flexibility. If you listen and look at um, the Ottawa experience, they tweaked and changed their strategy all the way through. Um, if you look at some of the successful um, community policing programs here in Australia and overseas, they constantly tweaked and changed, and we just need to accept that that's going to be the case for a while. So I don't have a magic KPI for us to prove it, unfortunately. Thank you. Amanda Lutz, I manage the Restorative Justice Unit here in Canberra. I'm really excited to hear about an approach that is keen to involve families and communities in, as part of the solution. Um, next year we're moving into working in the adult space um, with less serious and more serious offences and I would hope that police and the courts will be able to think innovatively and promote referrals to the unit alongside you know, drug courts and an approach that, that integrates um, a therapeutic response with, with a balance of accountability. I guess um, the stigma that you talk about might be one thing that uh, gets in the way of people wanting to be involved. Um, do you think that we're ready? I mean, I, I note with Jackie Lammy coming out and talking about her son's um, experience that it's becoming a lot more normalised and that people are, are, are talking about it more. Do you think that we're getting to that point where we can involve the community in an integrated approach? When it came to the heroin example, there was a landmark process or point in that, and it wasn't. It was the beginning of a journey, and it was sent a very powerful message to um, Australia's communities when Bob Hawke sat crying on TV about his um, daughter. It did so because it moved Australians from thinking that it was a problem for you know low socioeconomic areas or inner city areas that it was you know it was detached from them because if the prime minister's daughter could be addicted to heroin, anyone could be. In a similar way, I mean, I think that we're approaching that. I mean, two middle-aged conservatives, and I'm being kind, um, 19, <laughs> 19 interviews um, <laughs> since this morning. Um, people want to listen to that. You guys are here. Um, so, you know what, I think there is, there's growing, you're never going to get, I mean, for the public policy professionals in here, you're never going to get absolute consensus with this. It's always going to be a contentious a a area. But people are actually now willing to... Um, willing to actually consider an alternative. Um, the media are willing to ask 220 odd questions um, about this. So I think that, that's a positive signal that we need to take forward. No, I would agree, I think the community is absolutely ready. I, I, uh, it's interesting, um, I never look for 100%. Uh, having been in policing 32 years and a big proponent of restorative justice, as you know, Amanda. Um, I never look 100%. Instead, I look for the 85% we agree on. And I don't think health professionals, policing, community engagement professionals, I can't think of any two groups that can't come to 85% agreement. I don't think anyone thinks status quo is the success story. I think everyone believes we need to do something different. There wasn't, and we had reporters 
as you would say, from the left, the right, and the center today. I don't think anyone disagreed that we need to do something differently. And that's the start, I think, of how you move uh, communities forward. I think it's actually, oh, sorry, one more question and then we'll. Sure. So the very first meeting, uh, so we're clear, I, I, um, I actually called in CTV W5, which is a radio, a TV show in Canada, uh, to do a show on Canada called, or uh, Ottawa, called the crack capital of Canada, and I called out the premier and said that he wasn't doing enough. That's how this started. Um, I was still employed a week later, and I realized that maybe it was a good idea. Um, and you can go on uh, and, and uh, have a look, Google that if you wish, Crack Capital of Canada, CTVW5. But realistically, the first meeting I had were with uh, health professionals and uh, school board officials. The health professionals felt that we should do something totally different than where I was. They were into either decriminalization, legalization, supervised injection sites. Many things that I understood from where they were made sense. But from where I was, leading a community of a million people didn't make sense. And I convinced them that we would focus our energy on the 85%, as I discussed earlier. That we would focus our energy on education programs, early intervention models, and drug treatment. That's what we would focus on. I wouldn't take a shot at them on what they believe. They wouldn't take a shot at me on what I believe. Because I was still going to do law enforcement. Um, getting to that point uh, was probably the greatest success story. We met every month after that, and we would joke that we're here to talk about the 85% every month for five years when I was chief. I think that's where you find your success and the sweet spot of that community that when I retired from the Ottawa Police Service and I was appointed to Senator, not, I didn't have to run for election so I don't have to worry about those off ramps we discussed earlier politically, but when I retired from the Ottawa Police Service, I had every one of those people at my, at my event and they all said the same thing. We found a way to collaborate and that's really what this is about is finding that way to collaborate. You'll be pleased to know that amongst the recommendations, Andrew, that's, that's not actually one of them. So <laughs> we're, we're being edgy, but not quite that edgy. Um, so, I mean, I mean what, what can you say? I mean, you, you've said, John, that you know, we're facing a complex problem. Which, what security um, issue is not complex? But here we face an issue which seems to affect everybody in some way, be it in a very personal way of stories of personal experience with loved ones, relatives, those that they see in the street. I challenge anyone not to have one of those stories, albeit in a professional manner in the way that um, you're trying to deal with this very serious drug issue in your everyday lives to the political elites who are trying to assist and formulate policies that are going to work. Um, perhaps crying bullshit is a good thing and, and maybe if a think tank can assist in doing that once in a while then, then that's a good thing that we're here doing that as well and assisting you in doing so uh, conversely. I would also like to say that it, this isn't the end of a conversation. Please don't feel that by going away tonight that's finished. I, I see this as the opening of the conversation. Um, John and Vern are, are clearly here at your disposal to take this further, progress some of the themes that they've brought out here. Um, and I'd encourage you now to do so over a drink outside. Um, and thank you all for being here this evening, spending time with us. And, and please, I would like you to give your thanks to all of our speakers tonight, Gabe Broughtman, Stephen Jones, Commissioner Andrew Colvin. Thank you very much for joining us this evening.